Pencil Project started in Richard Rose's class, Art of the Printed Word, which is a wonderful, wonderful seminar taught in the JE Printing Press. And one of our assignments in that class was to go to some special collections library on campus and find two books and compare them. So I went to the Beinecke and I decided that I wanted to look at an old edition of, of Pride and Prejudice. So I went and looked at the first edition and I went and looked at this 1832 edition that I sort of pulled just for fun. The 1832 edition ended up being crazy. It was just so surprising. I was expecting something that would look more like the first edition, which is like sort of what you would expect. It's a little bit stayed. It's three volumes. It's in a lovely sort of calf binding. But this 1832 edition is from Philadelphia and it's you know, just like about 20 years later. The printing is different, not even really bound. The binding is sort of crumbling. It has to be in a box to hold it all together. It has ad material in the back and the title has been changed. The book is called Elizabeth Bennett or Pride and Prejudice instead of Pride and Prejudice. So I was really interested in this particular edition. That's sort of what got me going about this whole thing because it was what I had expected to be a classic original edition, but it ended up making me think a lot about how modern it feels. And then I went and looked at a like 2010 edition in Bass that people reference very often for Jane Austen classes and realized that that edition, which I had expected to be sort of modern, was really hearkening more towards the past. It was trying to sort of look in a lot of ways like the first edition with its really large margins to sort of put the text on a pedestal. It seemed like it was sort of trying to go backwards in time, whereas this 1832 edition had been trying to go forwards in time. And so I, I just got fascinated by that. When I was sort of translating it from this initial smaller paper to an exhibit, I wanted to think about whether I wanted to stay in the special collections area and think about sort of older adaptations or whether I wanted to take a more modern approach because there are a lot of very modern things that have been done with Pride and Prejudice. And I ended up deciding that I really wanted to focus on a couple of Yale collections, the ones in Sterling and Bass. And I think that the differences in those editions are just as fascinating as the differences in the early editions. And so I ended up just doing a major search in Orbis for every Pride and Prejudice adjacent book that I could possibly find, which took a while because there is a lot finding and picking out the ones that seemed like they sort of cohered together and that also displayed a big variety in terms of what's been done. My advisor is the wonderful Nancy Cole, who is a curator of American literature at the Beinecke. She was so helpful throughout this entire process. She's the one who encouraged me to apply to this. I work for her at the Beinecke, a collection of American literature. So that's how we were connected. During the process, I sort of had this whole multitude of books that I might want to put in an exhibit. Um, so she was the one who helped me sort of figure out techniques for arranging my categories and my books in a way that would tell a story. I was looking through so much information and one of the things that really surprised me was how much dramatization of Pride and Prejudice there was. There were so many, I mean, it seems to me, versions of Pride and Prejudice that had been turned into a play. And I only ended up including one of those, the A.A. A. Milne, because I thought it was so fun to have the author of Winnie Pooh in here. It at first surprised me, and then didn't surprise me at all. It just seems to really make sense, because there is a way in which Austen is such a theatrical writer. She's really into dialogue. She gives sort of stage directions as people are moving around. But I think that there are elements of the way that she writes that work really well in drama. And so that was why I thought it was so fun to see all those different dramatizations. And in terms of the pandemic, it's hard with a material texts oriented exhibit to move that online. And so I did a lot of thinking about that over the summer and a lot of strategizing and thinking about, well, some of these books, the things that I think are most interesting about them are not the fronts, but like the side of the pages. Some of them, I think the most interesting thing is like how thick or thin it is. Some of them, the thing is like that there are three of them that exist in this particular way. It was also 
interesting given that I had sort of still been in my research process a little bit when the quarantine hit. So some of these books in this exhibit, I have copies that exist in the Yale collections, which kills me because I really want to. And I would love to know like if some of them have really interesting annotations that some student left because annotations are something that really fascinates me or whether some of them like have pages torn out or things like that because that would be stuff that I would want to talk about in this exhibit. That's something that I hope you will be thinking about as you look through and imagining all sorts of fun and crazy and chaotic things that happen to a book when it's in a library. I think that translating something material to something virtual also makes you realize more how important the materiality is. And in that respect, I think that it's been a really useful endeavor and that it will continue to be a useful endeavor because when you look at a book, at a picture of a book, you realize how much you miss and you sort of think about the physicality more than you might if you had a like actual physical book in front of you.